Hello and welcome to part 5 of March to the Sea, the Vandals Let's Play campaign for Total War Attila. On the last episode, Gieselik, the governor of Carthaginensis, was adopted into the royal family by Godegisel. Gieselik, along with Gunderic, Godegisel's legitimate son, began the costly and lengthy undertaking of rebuilding the settlements of Carthaginensis, making extensive conversions and improvements of the existing settlement infrastructure to match the needs of our people. Godegisel arranged a marriage between Gieselik and the Saxon princess Gojifu. Never one to rest on his laurels, Godegisel commanded his forces to press even further into Iberia, levying a new army, the Solitude, commissioned by Athalaric, a man known for his lack of fear in the face of danger. Visimar is barely opposed in his assault on the walled settlement of Cordoba, the capital of the province of Bidica. Godegisel commissioned another governor, Radagasis, a man gifted with administrative skill. In return for their loyal service to the Vandals, Godegisel adopted both Athalric and Radagasis into the royal family. The Eastern Roman Empire offered us a stupendous trade subsidy of over 7,000, although we could not enter into any defensive or military pacts with them as they remain at war with some of our other allies. In spite of his choleric demeanor, Godegisel, deserve it or not, is becoming somewhat renowned for his deft handling of both domestic and foreign affairs. Unfortunately, in spite of, or perhaps due to, Visimar's reputation for violence, tensions in the province over intermittent famine, immigration, and instability led to an armed uprising. Visimar prepared to crush the rebellion immediately, however the calculating Gieselik advised him to lure the rebel forces into a sense of false security so that more dissidents would join them. Visimar was forced to go along with Gieselik's plan. After the rebel forces swelled substantially in size, both he and Gieselik rode east to confront the rebel army on the road to Carthago Nova. Although our Vandal forces clearly had an upper hand, the rebels were shockingly well-equipped and well-armed, consisting of high-quality cavalry and possessing siege equipment. It is likely that these were not mere rabble, but the results of a deliberate political sabotage by the Western Roman Empire. After a bloody battle during which our spears took heavy casualties from incoming onager fire and brutal cavalry charges, the enemy were finally routed after Visimar's troops hammered into their rear and flank, although the anvil provided by Gieselik's force was nearly broken in the process. Gieselik's gambit proved risky but successful and the province was pacified for the foreseeable future. The Aryan Hermitage was completed at Terraco and our very first Aryan priestess was recruited, a young woman named Scarillo, with a faith in her heart and a gift for public speech. Godegisel and the Oath continued their march across the mid-portion of Iberia, capturing Segobriga and Toledum. He was preceded by Hethan, who scouted ahead and identified a large but elusive Roman legion who stayed just ahead of the movements of the Oath and the Solitude, moving to the western coast of the peninsula. As we continued pushing across Iberia, western Roman separatist forces, Ostrogoths, and other barbarian tribes are converging on Mediolanum. The North African tribes have reclaimed parts of the coast of Africa and the Mediterranean. The Western Roman Empire is starting to look like a wounded animal, but they may still have the strength to lash out with ferocity. Looking around the map, we see that Illyria, Septimania, Gaul, and the Ostrogoth forces are massing in northern Italy, along with the Western Roman separatists. Ravenna has already been raised, and Verona is in Ostrogoth hands. The provinces around the Danube have been savaged by some unknown force, possibly the Huns or other nomadic tribes. The Eastern Roman Empire seems to be maintaining a strong grip on the Balkan Peninsula, although there are numerous migrating factions around the area of the Black Sea. In the north, internecine discord has divided the Langobards into loyalist and separatist factions, and civil war has destroyed their home in Aragalia. All but the last vestiges of the Roman Empire have been eradicated in northern Gaul and Britain, and our enemies turned allies, the Franks, have made great gains, crossing into Britain and occupying Camulodunum and Lindum, while the Abdanians and a Romanized faction of natives have occupied the remainder of Britannia Superior. The Geats have a small colony at Rhodomagus, while much of the rest of Gaul is the way we left it, bereft of civilization. 
Go to Jisil's wife, Galswintha, attempts to convince Indolf to open his mind to the possibility of returning as Godojisil's retainer and accept his father-in-law's generosity in treating him as a possible successor to the command of the oath. Godojisil smooths over a dispute between Giselik and Visimar, with Giselik questioning Godojisil's decision to have Visimar raised to such a position of power given his history of impetuousness. Hethen is confounded to discover that Legio 30 has eluded him as he attempts to track their movements near Pax Augusta. Fridobal moves into Asturica, but discovers that the Hispania army is off to the west on a campaign against the Roman forces at Brigantium. Leaving behind the somewhat troubled populace at Toledum, Godegisil continues his conquest at Emerita Augusta and the Roman garrison forces put up a fight, but only make a small dent in the Oath's numbers. As he enters the city, we receive an unexpected windfall as apparently the Romans in the city had just completed a brand new public works project that we can adapt to our own uses. In the end, Godegisil vandalizes the newly built Roman statue, tearing it down and putting the marble to use for our own buildings. In Carthaginensis, work begins to tear down the Roman encampment and to build a new chieftain's house at Toledum. I can't afford to convert the Roman-style government buildings at Segobriga or Toledum right now. Before the end of the turn, Gunderig gets a small boost to his skills as governor of Terraconensis, and Godegisil installs a nobleman named Liuva as governor of Lusitania, since our balance of power is becoming high enough to slightly upset the other nobles in the Vandal tribe. He immediately issues the resettlement edict in the province. Following the end turn phase, we find that both Giselik and Indolf were receptive to the entreaties made by Godegisil and Galsvintha, and Godegisil immediately moves to have Indolf restated as his lieutenant in the oath. Hethen turns back from his attempt to keep an eye on Legio 30 and moves into the province of Emerita Augusta to assist with the province reconstruction. He's joined there by his colleague Fridobal, to whom he hands off his spying missions as he will concentrate on the domestic work for now. Visimar scouts south from Cordoba, quickly accomplishing what Hethen could not, Flavius Eutychianus and Legio 30 are encamped on the southern coast at Malacca. Visimar is not able to cross the river and reach the enemy before winter, so he moves back to Cordoba. We set up several trade agreements, including with the Abdanians, Franks, Geats, and Jutes, which individually are small but combined should provide a substantial boost to our income. Additionally, several of the factions are willing to offer subsidies to obtain the trade agreement, so we make some extra money in that manner and Godegisil, having found himself at the head of a large barbarian military coalition, is now asking that new nations joining forfeit some wealth for the privilege of membership. With the fruits of his diplomatic labors, Godegisil is able to finance the conversion of the Roman Vicus at Toledum to a Vandal-style torp. Liuva orders the remainder of the Roman administrative buildings to be torn down and the building materials incorporated into the construction of a new granary. At Carthago Nova, the artisan workshop is upgraded to a smithy, and the sanitation at Segobriga is enhanced with the addition of troughs. Scurillo, already having begun her preaching outside of Terraco, is already able to enhance her abilities. Aryan Christianity is quickly rising in the province. Surprisingly, Flavius Eutychianus embarks and sails east into the Mediterranean just off the coast of Carthago Nova, leaving Malacca undefended. It isn't clear if he was called away to Rome or duties elsewhere, or if something more sinister is afoot. Genseric and his Alani wife Mata welcome a son whom they have named Cannabis, Genseric apparently having no compunction about naming a son after his own recreational activities. Indolf is again accepted as Godegisil's retainer, and I hope he intends to stay this time. Athalaric and Visimar again trade places as Athalaric brings the solitude to Carthago Nova to defend against any possible aggression by Flavius Eutychianus and to pacify the populace who, though no longer in open revolt, remain unhappy. Visimar and the Children of the Forest move west to Malacca, finding its garrison depleted since the departure of Legio 30, but not helpless as a significant number of troops remain. However, many remain on ships in the harbor rather than in the city itself. Although Visimar feels instinctively that something is wrong, he orders the attack on the settlement. With the balance bar clearly in my favor, this battle could be auto-resolved without much chance of defeat, but I might suffer severe casualties, so I'll fight it myself to see if I can do better. 
Visimar uses a familiar tactic of circling around the settlement to approach from the west so that the enemy will be less prepared for his assault. The children of the forest move covertly in the morning fog, although Visimar orders the army to wait until the sun has burned away the mist. Once the fog has cleared sufficiently, he orders the attack. I have a fairly standard setup with a long front line of heavy spear infantry backed up by melee axe infantry. Our only supporting troops are a single unit of Germanic hunters who are situated to the south of our line and a unit of cavalry who are deployed on the north side. The naval garrisons begin moving in toward the shore and Visimar orders the archers to launch a few volleys of flaming arrows at the ships, not really expecting to cause significant damage but perhaps causing a few casualties. Surprisingly, the ships moved to land outside the city. Something was definitely amiss in this settlement. The line shifts to present the marines making landfall with our heavy spearmen, and the archers withdraw to behind the line. The spearmen form up into a solid spear wall, and the enemy marine infantry attack anyway, slowly moving in and hacking at our spearmen. Visimar orders his men to mob the marines except for a single unit of axemen who are sent in pursuit of the Roman archers nearer to the city. Meanwhile, the Germanic warband cavalry have moved around behind our forces to the west, and they charge at the enemy archers. As they smash into the lightly armored group of men, bodies fly and blood stains the sand on the beach. Our unmounted Germanic warband axe unit pursuing the other unit of archers is having much less success, as the archers frustratingly skirmish with our men firing a volley of arrows and then retreating several paces just out of reach. The Roman Marine infantry begin wavering, although they are incredibly difficult to kill, even with so many of our forces ganging up on them. Even as his men break and begin to flee, the Roman centurion Eutropius Culio snarls as he glimpses Visimar turning to face him and issuing a challenge. Our axe units are having none of this Roman show of bravado, however, and the Roman commander is unceremoniously dispatched by axes descending on him from all sides. Our archers have moved up and are firing without much effect at the enemy tower at the edge of the settlement, although they are managing to set a few small fires here and there. The Germanic Mounted Warband Cavalry charge at the last remaining unit of archer marines who have nearly reached the settlement. Their fear of what is outside the settlement evidently overcoming their fear of whatever may be inside the settlement. They are caught by our cavalry, but this leaves an opening for the AI to cut off our cavalry from behind with their scout equites who are nearby at the entrance of the enemy settlement. The Romans seize this opportunity charging in with the scout equites. Even though our Germanic mounted warband would be more than a match for the scout equites, who are fairly poor cavalry, this pinned my cavalry in place and I was not able to pull them out in time. Mired in combat, our cavalry come under increasing pressure from the numerous enemy, including a unit of heavily armed legio. Under duress, they break and then rout, being cut down by the scout equites before they can ever escape. Unhappy with this turn of events and feeling a bit outsmarted by a lesser foe, Visimar orders his infantry to converge on the enemy legionnaires and cavalry. The Axe Warband units and spears make quick work of the units presented to them at the city entrance, rapidly forcing them back. They then take control of the tower, pitching the archers occupying it over the side and then setting fire to the structure. As Visimar continues to press in with the bulk of his infantry where the main fighting is occurring at an avenue running to the northeast, Two units of spearmen and a single axe unit move in from the south of the city near the docks, bypassing a hastily erected barricade to confront the enemy archers hiding behind it. Visimar is impeded in his advance along the street, which is filled with corpses mostly by the press of men stumbling to escape the swinging Germanic axes and stumbling over one another in their flight. In the rush of battle, Visimar barely notices that some of the corpses lining the street are not fresh. Having routed the archers behind the barricade, the remainder of our infantry close in from behind, cutting off the enemy's retreat, and the result is mass carnage, with the Germanic warband axes wildly hacking at the thick Roman armor looking for any opening as their victims attempt in vain to find some means of escape from their fate. With their grim business finished, Visimar orders the magistrate hunted down to complete the capture of the settlement. He is located defending the southern entrance to the walled town square with a regiment of spears. Visimar orders one unit of Germanic spearmen to hold firm in the street running south of the square, while he sends the other available unit into the square from its west entrance to circle around and entrap the enemy. Saturnius Flavius and his retinue of spears attempt to escape from the city to the west, but are met by Germanic spear wall, while the other unit of Germanic spearmen move in from behind. Although a unit of Legio near Visimar briefly rally, 
They are quickly broken and sent fleeing past their archer comrades with the contagious panic rippling through the enemy at this point, with Saturnius Flavius yielding to Vizimar's spear infantry. Or perhaps the panic itself was not contagious, but it was in response to something else contagious. Vizimar occupies the settlement, although he finds the streets mostly devoid of citizens, and there are several cartloads of bodies which appear to have been hastily piled up for removal from the city, although the task was obviously not completed. Gathering his troops in the town square, Vizimar looks around, unable to find his retainer, Genseric, Godogisil's son and heir, asking the men present, where is Genseric? He initiates a search for the Vandal Prince, offering a handsome reward for locating him. Just before dusk, he's approached by an archer with downcast eyes. Tragedy has befallen us today. Your son Genseric suffered a crippling injury during the Battle of Malacca. During intense fighting with the Roman garrison inside the city, his leg was caught under the full weight of a falling horse. He was also temporarily rendered unconscious, although he's awake now but in great pain. The leg is badly mangled. I have seen such injuries and they are the end of a soldier's career. Perhaps he can still serve you in some administrative capacity, as his brother does at Terraco, if he survives. I am sending him to Carthago Nova for medical attention. I am truly sorry for this terrible misfortune. Your loyal subject, Isamar. Although not a physician, Bismar has seen many battlefield injuries in his illustrious career, and he concludes that the young man's injuries, although not fatal, are serious enough that he will never fight or ride a horse again, and he will be fortunate if he's able to walk after many months of recuperation. He sends Genseric with a small armed escort east to Carthago Nova, where he can receive medical treatment, while he prepares a message to go to Gisel to inform him of his son's misfortune. I start constructing a farmstead at Toledum, primarily so I can have access to cavalry units in the province. The Chieftain's Hall is complete at Terraco, and I deliberate for a bit on whether to upgrade it to a Warlord's Hold, a Great Hall, or a Tavern. The Warlord's Hold would allow me to recruit champions, although I'm hesitant to use the city construction slot for this purpose since an equivalent building can also be constructed in the smaller town settlements. The Great Hall provides access to Vandal Berserkers and gives a faction-wide research bonus which is tempting. However, I eventually settle on the tavern since it will give the biggest public order bonus, the most wealth, and also gives access to light Moorish cavalry. It also gives a reduction to the immigration penalties. All three buildings will give access to noble Germanic swordsmen. We continue to improve our diplomatic situation, although it couldn't be much better, with the Marcomans agreeing to a defensive alliance and both the Lugians and Varinians joining our military coalition. We see several Roman forces of varying size moving around the Mediterranean. It is now 404 AD, and we find that the Romanized British faction has been eliminated by someone, perhaps the Franks. Although Gieselic has to call in favors to secure his position, he, Radagasus, and Gunderic are raised to the station of tribal elders, which will help them with their province government. Gunderic seems to have fully committed himself to his architectural pursuits and gains the engineer trait. And Visimar now has discovered the reason for Flavius Eutychianus' rapid departure and the squalid state of Malacca. The city was all but deserted. No frightened citizens emerged from their homes. There lay fresh corpses in the street mixed with bodies over a week old. The stench of death was in the air, permeating everything everywhere. We entered one of the houses and found a group of people laying on the floor. Most of the people were still dead or comatose. A few moaned or wept silently. Athanaric dragged one into the light so we could see her. She was young, perhaps adolescent. Her skin was covered in flat pustules and sores. She was hardly moving. I asked him not to, but Athanaric pulled another one to the doorway. The skin of this one was purple, blotchy, and dark, like a clot of blood. He was not moving at all, and did not appear to be breathing. At this time, Visimar came to the house, and seeing the people on the ground, ordered the door shut and barred, and anyone who touched one of the afflicted to be shut inside with them. I'm told we're leaving at once, and will not return until the pestilence has passed. I will have to tell Athanaric's wife what has befallen him.
so it seems there's been an outbreak of pestilence at Malacca. I start converting the fruit dryer to a grape press which has less squalor, and although it provides considerably less food, it has a slightly larger public order bonus and provides much more of the wine resource for trade. I start tearing down the cavalry corral to make room for a sanitation structure, and Visimar frantically orders his army to leave the settlement at once, force marching them across the river and not stopping until the children of the forest reach Cordoba. Skrilo is again able to improve her skills, becoming even more adept at inspiring the populace. Having saved many souls in Terraco, she moves into Segobra, taking time to speak with the people there about Aryan Christianity as she travels on her way to the more war-torn provinces of Iberia who truly need her soothing words. Since Gensrik is no longer with the Children of the Forest, I spend the numerous skill points he acquired while he was Visimar's retainer. I also take a moment to upgrade Radagasis' skills, and then I end the turn. Flavius Eutychianus moves back to just off the coast of Carthago Nova with his legion and a small naval escort. With the threat of Roman attack by sea seemingly imminent, Genseric is struck by an idea. Gieselic, I know I will never be able to fight in my father's army again. And although I know he'll take pity on me for my injury, I do not want his empathy. I've learned too much and come too far in my travels to resign myself to be ruled by infirmity. I will lead our people to new lands and even greater wealth. I know I'm just a man, but I speak these words in sincerity. How are we to accommodate you then? There is a tree which grows here called the larch, and you have much of its timber. We will gather shipwrights here to Carthago Nova and we'll build a navy. My brother Gunderick can help you with the details. He has a talent for such things. We'll hire mercenary captains for now to train our marines until we can develop a proper navy. In this way, I will earn my father's admiration, the respect of our people, and the right to govern our new empire. There will be great cost in this endeavor. Do not worry about the cost, Gieselik. I understand your concerns. Although I cannot assist with the physical labor, I will help with the resource allocation and the ledgers. I do not mean to boast, but I have been told I have excellent penmanship. I raise our first navy, the Larchen Prows, at Carthago Nova, with Genseric as its admiral. Genseric orders the recruitment of as many ships as the province will sustain, and I also hire mercenary artillery and assault Liburnians for now, since we don't have access to those units yet. We've finished development of community markets, so perusing the tech tree, I settle on defined army taxation, which will provide a reduction in recruitment costs for melee infantry. On the diplomacy panel, I continue shaking down the friendly factions for a few extra coins as the Jutes, Caledonians, Marcomans, Franks, and Gepids join our military alliance. I take a look at the objectives panel to see how close we are to a minor victory, given our numerous allies, and it's actually not that far. We require 30 settlements, and we now have 26 between the ones the Vandals have captured in Iberia and those of our allies. We'll still need to get four more and to hold the entirety of Galicia and Vitica, and we'll need to hold on to all of these allies until 425 AD, which might not be possible. At Malacca, which is still suffering from disease, I go ahead and start converting the fishing jetty to a trade jetty. I also start upgrading Terraco to a small city. Fridabal moves back toward his palace. I think the time has come to start scouting Africa, so I will move him across the Strait of Gibraltar next turn. Due to the perpetual state of provincial instability I have in Iberia from the constant military actions that have been going on for the past four years, my armies have to stay put, and there's little else I can do. I upgrade Liuva's skills and then end the turn. Instead of attacking at Carthago Nova, Flavius Eutychianus and his naval escort are joined by another sizable Roman legion, and they sail to just off the coast of Malacca. It seems that Visimar has been spreading foul rumors about the provincial government Radagasis after losing a game of dice with him. Visimar tells his men that Radagasis cheats at dice 
and that he is a pisser-bed, cod-nibbling, rotund hoof merchant. Vizimar's remarks about Redegasis' manhood reach go to Giesel's ears, and he orders Vizimar to stop spreading the rumors, but agrees to make up his financial loss on the dice game, while also levy some reinforcements for the depleted children of the forest, and agrees to promote him to high judge, recognizing Vizimar's great service to the Vandal people. It's not clear how many of the insults were actually true, but apparently Vizimar was not entirely fabricating his allegations about the dice. Vizimar adds a couple of regiments of Germanic hunters and a new onager to his force, while Genseric continues building ships for the Larchen prows. I go ahead and convert the trade jetty at Carthago Nova to a military jetty. This will let us recruit some of the specialty naval units like Artillery Liburnian, the Strike Liburnian, and the Greek Fire Drumanarian. It also provides a substantially stronger naval garrison for the port city, to the extent that if I upgrade the city itself, it probably will not need an army to defend it. The drawback, however, is a loss of 900 income per turn. It's a steep price to pay, but I will need at least one military port to fully outfit my navies. It did take a moment to move Hethen back to the province to take advantage of his fairly substantial building cost reduction. I cancel the construction at Malacca since the building conversions underway are fairly expensive and I cannot move an army in to defend the settlement. I'm afraid the Romans might occupy or raise it, with that invested money subsequently lost. I pan around the map briefly and notice there's a tremendous amount of pillaging going on in the province around Mediolanum by numerous armies while the city itself remains under Ostrogoth siege. Cotogisel moves south toward Malacca, attempting again to intercept Flavius Eutychianus. Although he moves through Cordoba, he takes some time to outfit his spears with the heavier equipment of Germanic spearmen. Nevertheless, in the intern phase, the Roman legions part ways with their naval escort and move south toward the coast of Africa, away from Malacca. Sadly, a young girl, Fridilo, from the royal family was lost to infant mortality. We now have serious public order issues in Cordoba, with a rebellion imminent, so Godogiso replaces the Children of the Forest with his larger army, the Oath, as Vizimar takes the Children of the Forest off toward Emerita Augusta. Both he and Athalarag take some time to train some additional troops for their forces. Skurilo finally makes her way to the war-torn and disease-ridden province of Bitica just in time, deploying her Inspire Populous ability to get the public order change at least back to neutral. I also move Hethen into Malacca, and get back to work converting the fruit dryer and the fishing jetty. And I also start constructing a well in the empty construction site. With the public order fires put out, at least for the moment, I end the turn. The Jutes apparently have moved all the way to the Mediterranean and captured the island of Ajax. I'm not terribly happy about this even though they are military allies, since I'm planning on taking this province eventually, but that could be some time from now and there's no guarantee the Jutes will be able to hold it. There is quite a bit of movement during the Western Roman Empire's turn, and one of the two legions near us has started to move toward the western coast of Iberia. The Lugians ask us to declare war on the Venetians as part of our alliance, so I agree. It actually doesn't make much difference to me, but the Venetians are far away and no real threat. It's now 405 AD, and I move Hethen back to Carthaginensis to upgrade the Chieftain's Hall. Fridabal is now in northern Africa, and he discovers a Morian spy near Tingis, which is garrisoned by Legio 30. Odegisel moves back to Emerita Augusta, hopefully to continue pushing toward the western coast of Iberia once the provincial order is stabilized. Vizimar garrisons Cordoba and recruits one more unit each of Germanic hunters and Germanic warband. Genseric recruits still more ships while disbanding the mercenaries. Gieselic and Gunderic are each nominated to be raised to the judge position. During the intern phase, Legio 13 very strangely sails back to the coast of Africa and then crosses the Strait of Gibraltar into his palace. Malacca seems to have finally rid itself of the smallpox, but there's still quite a bit of squalor present, so I continue upgrading the well. Godogisel moves west to Olispo, finally reaching the western coast of Iberia. 
He defeats the small garrison present and occupies the settlement. Having successfully led the Vandals from their original home in Pannonia across the continent and conquering the Iberian Peninsula from coast to coast, Godogisla has cemented his status as a legend. I upgrade his skills accordingly. To celebrate his achievement, Godogisla puts on a brand new pair of sandals because everybody likes a Vandal in sandals. With Vettius Tranquilius having landed on the southern coast of Iberia at his palace, Bismar quickly mobilizes his forces, assaulting Espalus in a daring night raid before the Roman legion has the opportunity to bolster the settlement's defenses. The children of the forest occupy the settlement and Bismar institutes a brutal military crackdown on the populace. With the public order levels now thermonuclear in Bidica, Athalaric and Genseric both move into Malacca to garrison the city. I'm finally able to get the situation under control by exempting the province from tax, although it leaves my income levels extremely low. The Roman fleet in the eastern Mediterranean eliminates or chases off the Verinian horde there. Legio 13 moves just off the coast of Iberia, while Legio 30 remains in northern Africa. Gaul asks for our assistance in their war against the Langobard separatists, and I agree, although the dispute is somewhat far from where we are, and we are not in much of a practical position to dispatch a force. In the fall of 405 AD, Gunderic and Veneranda welcome a son, Archibald. Godegisel is becoming even more well known for his diplomatic dealings, earning the diplomatic tone trait, which raises his trade tariff bonus to 20%. With the powder keg and Bidica in a slightly safer situation, Genseric moves back to Carthago Nova. I start demolishing some of the Roman infrastructure at Alispo to make room for Vandal buildings. This time, it's Lusitania that has the greater public order problem, and I reinstitute taxation of Bidica and exempt Lusitania. Fortunately, Lusitania is providing a less significant part of our total income. Inspecting the list of wealthy provinces throughout the world, we see that the current highest one is just next door to us at Mauritania, which includes the Morian held province of Caesarea. That should be an easier target for us once we move on to Africa. Once again, I let the turn end, having little more I can do on a limited budget with an upset populace. During the Western Roman Empire's turn, Legio 30 has moved to just off the coast near Olispo, and Legio 13 is nearby. I'll try to eliminate these forces with Genseric's navy once he's completely ready. Genseric is raised to the political office of Elder, although not without his father putting in a word on his behalf. Hethan moves westward toward the newly captured settlements of Lusitania, to assist with the reconstruction. Hunila has reached rank 2 while Scarillo has reached rank 4, and both improve their skills. Scarillo has maximized the effects of her local religious and public order abilities, and has now made her way to the betray skill in the tree, which will let her carry out actions on enemy agents. A relatively small Legio 10, which contains 8 units, is on land at Palma. They pose a minor threat at most, but could cause more trouble if they reinforce a larger army, so I'll have to keep an eye on them. At Emerita Augusta, I start building a pasture and continue the demolition of the Roman buildings at Olispo. Lusitania would be a good province to build farmsteads since they are actually providing quite a bit of food and wealth due to the excellent local fertility. We've finished defined army taxation, so my next research project is standardized equipment, which does allow the construction of the steel forge from the smithy but for the most part, it's a roadblock on the way to some of the higher tier technologies such as mastery of terrain and combat at a distance, which unlock higher tier naval units, cavalry, and archers. They in turn are needed on the way to unlocking the large onager, an extremely powerful siege unit. Bismar force marches to Olispo to reinforce Godogisel should the Romans decide to land in force. Genseric and the Larch and Prow sail to Malacca, while Athalaric garrisons his palace. I did not know exactly where the Romans might attack, but I'm attempting to keep the western part of the peninsula a bit stronger since I have little in the way of town garrisons there. Gieselic ranks up, gaining the Hunter and Sentinel skills. Fridabal scouts further east across the northern coast of Africa. The shadows are I end the turn and wait the Roman response. Legio 10 remains near Palma, however they have embarked. Off the western coast of Iberia, the Romans have amassed quite an army, with two legions and a navy situated directly adjacent to Olispo.
We receive a new mission to learn the Manoral Lands technology in nine turns in exchange for a civil research bonus. On the diplomacy map, I can see that the Ostrogoths have finally taken Mediolanum. The southern provinces of Italy, including Rome itself, remain in Western Roman hands, but they are fading fast, having declined in strength ranking to three, while the Vandals have risen to rank four. And the Western Roman Empire has about as many enemies as we have allies, and only 16 provinces left. I would like to at least eliminate their land holdings in this area, taking the remainder of Galicia, and probably their remaining province in Mauritania before I start any more wars, such as with Hispania or the Maurians. Fridobal moves further into Africa, to the gemstone-cutting province of Dimity. Although I greatly desire this resource, these cities look fairly well defended with the buildings being in the Tier 3 range. A more reasonable man has taken the throne for the Geats, for while they still remain aggressive and temperamental us. by description, he does finally agree to join my military alliance. They are of comparable strength to us, so I think this is actually a fairly important alliance to get. We also add the Iazages, and I'm not sure the military ally column will hold many more icons. The Roman buildings have been cleared away at Alispa with the exception of the Vicus, so I start building a farmstead given the excellent region fertility. I also start constructing a well to improve the sanitation province-wide, and begin the conversion of the fishing jetty to a trade jetty since we won't need the food with the farmstead. Bizamar and the children of the forest stay near Alispo, reinforcing Godegisel and the Oath, who continue to garrison the settlement, while Genseric and the Larchen Prowls manage to sneak past the Roman force to the port of Alispo. From what I can see, Legio 30 and Legio 13 don't have any outstanding units, but there are still a large number of forces present. Will the Roman forces attack? Based on their past actions, I expect they will sail away without engaging us, but you'll have to wait until the next time to find out. Thanks for watching and please join me again for the next episode of March to the Sea.